Chris Jurish is a technical advisor to fruit growers in South Africa, providing expert advice on all technical aspects of production and research to individual growers. Chris qualified in pomology from Stellenbosch University and has spent the last 30 years working across all areas of fruit production, including pruning, training, pest and disease control, crop load management and pollination. I think, Angie, the, to improve production, you have to start with your planting material. <clears throat> the tree that you plant should be virus-free, at least 1.8 metres tall when you receive the tree. That's always a good start. If you can start with a big tree, it means you can fill your canopy space sooner. That's the thing that's really made an impression on me, is the quality of the planting material that you guys live with and make the best of, okay? So I think that's very important, It's the, the total quality of the tree. Um, having said that, I think we must try to fill the, the allotted space as quickly as possible. In the first two to three years, you should be up to, to the required tree height um, with sufficient side branching to be able to start thinking about cropping that tree. Back home, we um, start cropping definitely in year three and we reach maximum production by about year 10, 11. That's very important because it's um, all along, you, you're producing costs all along. So you have to get tonnage on that orchard as soon as possible. So yeah, I think that's one of the big things. Um, I think you have good soils compared to the soils we have back home. For growing a good tree fast, up and filling the space is more in your favor than it is back home. We have to really battle to get trees to grow on some of our soils, okay? <clears throat> Very intensive management to get the tree up there. Um, the other thing that's struck me since I've been here, especially in the canning side of things, is the, the sort of productions you're talking of seem to be quite low. We would consider 30 tons to the hectare, 40 tons to the hectare, too low. We're more interested in 60 tons, 50, 60 tons. Um, having said that, we'd, we cannot base our entire industry on the canning prices that we receive. So I think we're obviously export oriented um, with Packhams and with Pharrell and with some Bartlett's or BC's as we call them. Um, so yeah, we, our, our marketing setup is, is, is different. We're not cannery oriented, if you like. So I think what I'm trying to say is you've got to get more tonnage on your canning pairs so that you can get more money for what you, the effort that you're putting in onto that hectare. Um, then I think the export market, I don't know how you're exporting is, um, when I say export, I mean out of the country to a foreign market, because I believe there are opportunities out there to make good money. We make very good money out of Packhams, out of Pharrell, our standard pack varieties, okay? So I think that's a big difference between us and your industry. Yeah, so I think to sum it up, I would say um, rootstocks, tree quality, filling the tree space, working at filling the tree space as soon as possible, and then sorting out your, your, your you know, to imp improve, it, if you like, on the, on the income that you receive for your, all your, the effort that you put into the, to growing the tree and producing the fruit. Okay, what I look for when I come to an orchard to prune the orchard, I first have a good look at the tree age, and I try to get a background to the production, the production history, actually. I like, I like to have the previous three years production history as a sort of reference point. I also like to know the, the, the quality of the fruit produced as a sort of a, also as a reference point. When it comes to pruning a young tree, I don't like to prune the tree in winter time at all if possible for the first two to three years. I realize there is pruning to be done, but I don't like it to be a major operation in winter time because that's not the best time for developing a tree structure because you tend to promote growth in the wrong places if you prune too severely in winter. So, just a summary for, for young trees, I try not to do too much winter pruning. I prefer to do um, summer manipulation and breaking out unwanted shoots in summertime, um, tying branches into position in summertime in the growing season or just when growth has stopped in sort of like January. And winter pruning is really just a little touch up here and there on things we might have missed during summer. When it comes to bearing trees, and I have a quality problem, let's, let's take Packhams as an example. Um, I like to use the winter time to try to readjust the, the fruiting positions or the, yeah, the, the fruiting positions and the orientation of the fruiting wood with a pruning shear. 
And that's the winter time cut. It's not um, meant to be a, a type of a stimulatory type of action. It's more on the spur work and the fruiting systems that I have um, on the tree at the time. So, and I don't like to prune at all, unnecessarily severely. This morning, um, I was at a orchard and I saw a guy using a pneumatic pruner and it was actually quite frightening to see the amount of wood that was being cut off <coughs> at this time of year, which is winter time, because I could just visualize the regrowth from those cuts. And in my mind, if you prune like that every winter, you, you're not creating fruiting area, you, you're just stimulating growth every year and you're cutting every year. So you're paying for a, for a cutting operation, not a, but I believe not a pruning operation. Pruning is, um, is a very, um, it's, an, it's an art really, it's not a, a science in many ways. You, you have to be able to read the tree, um, make the cut that will give you the desired result. Uh, yeah, so, so, so that's what I try to do with winter pruning. But in my book, I, I say again, I think pruning is a part of tree training. Pruning is part of tree training, tying down is a part of tree training, cracking of shoots to promote fruitfulness is tree training. So pruning is just one aspect. Of, of tree training. But I also say you can cut a lot of crop off by doing injudicious cuts if you like. Yeah, where I come from the we won't go over the whole virus free status about of, of planting material because we have a virus free setup back home. So the trees that we grow are healthy, they grow quickly. I think the successful grower is the one that can get the tree up to its height and fill the space as quickly as possible. That that's a fact. Um, he gets it cropping in year three on pears, definitely in year three, a, a little light crop. And as I said earlier, pretty much optimum production by year 12. Let's say year 12, but good production. I think um, the successful grower pays a lot of attention to the detail involved in producing quality fruit. And that involves obviously winter pruning to eliminate branch marks and spraying his spray materials, his pest and disease control materials at the right time. Um, I think that the successful grower back home is the person that pays attention to detail, gets high tonnages, gets good packouts, and has got a, I would say, a guaranteed, or is on a um, very well defined marketing program. He knows where his fruit's going, he knows what the market demands. We, we export, as I said, export oriented. So he knows that his Packham's pear is going to go to the UK market or to the European market, and those demands are blemish free fruit. Um, of a certain size, and he is able to produce that by doing the detail that he does back home on the farm. So that's the successful farmer. He pays attention to all the detail. You can't, in the fruit game, you can't afford to miss or what, what shall I say, neglect um, certain aspects like pollination or pruning or irrigation or thinning or fertilizing. There's so many facets. But the good farmers are the ones that can manage all those things and integrate them all for a profitable end result. I think the future for pear production in my country is good um, as long as we can maintain our standards of quality, our standards of commitment and attention to detail, I think it's very good. I think our saving grace, if you like, if we can use that term, is that we do have established markets overseas. Our fruit is recognized as, as good quality fruit and value for money. The, um, the markets are happy with our fruit. The grower is getting a reasonable return. He could get a better return, obviously. <laughs> it's always like that with growers worldwide, I think. But the growers back home are making good money out of pears, out of certain varieties especially. So I think the prospects um, for the future for South Africa and pears is, is very good. We have new um, cultivars coming on, online, novelty products. I think the world out there is looking for novelty too. Not, don't overdo the novelty because there are some varieties like but it had been around for hundreds of years and people are still buying them and enjoying them. So the novelty is just to keep an interest, I think, in, in pear marketing and growing worldwide, keep, keep it going. You know, you need some interest too. So I think we on a very, the South African market is looking very positive. Um, I wouldn't like to elaborate on the potential for Australia, but I do see opportunities, as I said earlier, I think, in, in, in trying to expand expand your domestic market somehow um, but that's a very difficult one for me to answer just in one week of, of experience of Australian fruit you know but I would like you guys to if possible if there's more money to be made on the export market go for it you've got all the conditions in your favor you've got good soils 
you, it's a bit dry, but I mean, you know, we can, we can, it'll, the, water, the rain will come sometime, we hope. There are methods to overcome or limit the effect of drought in the orchards, mulching and so on, but um, try, to, try to promote your, your product. You have a good product, I believe that. <clears throat> it's just that it seems to me the growers are not getting the returns that they, I would like to say, deserve, because honestly, I'm a grower, really. I like to speak on the growers' behalf whenever I get the opportunity. And um, I really think the growers need to get more value for money, if you like.